we will first talk about the models of a discrete time system. You recall that in the continuous case of a continuous time system, taking the familiar example of an RLC network, the governing, differential, the governing equations for an RLC network under dynamic conditions are differential equations. So the circuits are represented by differential equations. Now suppose you are given a differential equation and you are asked to find out an RLC network for which this particular differential equation pertains, then it is not all that easy. It can be done, but the problem is slightly complicated. On the other hand, if you are given a differential equation and you are asked to find out a circuit representation for that, then it is possible to find out a simple circuit using a model which includes integrators, summing amplifiers, and a coefficient setting potentiometers, just like in your analog computer implementation of simulation of a dynamic system. So in the modeling of a continuous time system, a very useful way in which it can be done is using integrators, summing amplifiers, and potential dividers, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, if we are talking about a discrete time system, so we should have a similar type of models, such circuit elements, which together constitute a model of a discrete time system. Here, the elements that constitute such models are of three kinds. One is an adder. An adder, suppose what we have represented is a two input adder. If we have two signals, x1n and x2n are coming in, at any sampling instant n, the output will be the sum of these two inputs. So x, the output will be x1n plus x2n. This can be extended to an adder which have several inputs. For example, if you have k inputs, x1n, x2n up to xkn, the output will be the sum of the k inputs. That is one element. The second element is the delay element. If you are having a sequence of values fed into the delay element, at every given instant, the output will be the value of the input at one previous sampling instant. That means the whole sequence of inputs are reproduced here with a delay of one unit. Therefore, if xn is the input at that particular in instant of time, the output will be xn minus 1. This is the delay element. So this produces one unit delay. If you want to two unit delays, two delays, you can put two such delay elements in cascade. So this is quite obvious. A third element is what is called a coefficient multiplier, in which you, the signal input xn is the input. And this is multiplied by a certain constant that you put. This is the coefficient. So alpha times xn will be the output. So this is what is called a coefficient multiplier. Once we have these three elements, we can model any linear discrete time system or difference equation suitably. So let us look at a couple of examples to see how you can find out the difference equation corresponding to a system which includes these various kinds of elements. First example. Let us take this example where we have an adder with an input xn coming here and another input coming here. And the output of the adder is what we call yn, the output. yn is delayed by one unit. Therefore, if this is yn, the signal here will be yn minus 1. And that is multiplied by alpha, a coefficient multiplier. So the output of the coefficient multiplier is going back to this adder. So the sum of these two signals will be yfn. So what do we have now? yfn is therefore the sum of this plus this. This is xn, and this is yn minus 1. This multiplied by alpha. Therefore, this signal here will be alpha times yn minus 1. 
So yn will be xn plus alpha times yn minus 1. So yn will be alpha times yn minus 1 plus xn. So this is the difference equation to which this particular system pertains. This is the model of this difference equation. This is the first order system. Let us take a more complicated example where we have two delay elements involved. This is another system. Let us you know, take it down. Input xn is given to a summer. This is not a, certainly there is a small error here. Let me put this here. So input xn is given to a coefficient multiplier alpha. Therefore, the signal here will be half times xn. And that signal plus two other signals are given to this adder. And the output of the adder is given to a delay element. And the delay element is given to, again, the output of the delay element given to a coefficient multiplier. And that is one input to this adder. And the output of this adder is yn. yn is delayed by a delay element here, therefore the signal here is yn minus 1. And that is fed to the coefficient multiplier here, 1 fourth, therefore the signal here will be 1 fourth of yn minus 1. That is the signal that is coming here. And now this yn minus 1 is also fed to another coefficient multiplier, therefore the signal here will be half of yn minus 1. Now, another signal is coming after this delay element. Suppose we call this signal here as un. So this will be un minus 1. So this signal here will be un minus 1 because if this is un, this will be un minus 1. So un minus 1 is multiplied by 1 fourth and put this to the adder. So un will therefore be xn half of times half times xn plus half times yn minus 1 plus 1 fourth of un minus 1. Therefore, un will be half of xn plus half of yn minus 1 plus 1 fourth of un minus 1. So this equation represents the characteristics of this adder. Un will be half of xn plus half of yn minus y of n minus 1 plus 1 fourth of un minus 1. That is what we are having here. Similarly, your output of this adder yn will be the sum of this. If this is un minus 1, this, this signal will be half of un minus 1 plus 1 fourth yn minus 1. Therefore, yn will be half of un minus 1 plus 1 fourth yn minus 1, and that is this equation. yn equals 1 fourth yn minus 1 plus half of un minus 1. So you have these two equations, and when we to find out the difference equation connecting the output yn and the input xn, we have to eliminate this intermediate variable un. This can be done in several ways. And one way in which it can be done is we take this equation un equals half xn plus yn minus 1 plus 1 fourth un minus 1. And since we already have an expression for un minus 1 in terms of yn and yn minus 1, we substitute that here. So half xn plus half yn minus 1. For 1 fourth y un minus 1, you substitute half of yn minus 1 8th yn minus 1, half of yn minus 1 8th yn minus 1. And simplifying that, you get half of xn plus 3 8th yn minus 1 plus half of yn. Now, still we have to get rid of un. So if this un is this much, un minus 1 will be decrement the independent variable by one step. If un is this much, un minus 1 will be half of xn minus 1 plus 3 eighths of y n minus 2 plus half of y n minus 1 because n is replaced by n minus 1. But we have an expression for u n minus 1 from the first equation. u n minus 1 from the first equation is after all 2 times y n minus half of y n minus 1 from the first equation. So u n minus 1 is 2 times y n minus half of y n minus 1. So if you equate these two, you have a single equation joining yn and xn in the difference equation form. So equating these two, we finally arrive at an expression, the difference equation for the system, yn equals half of yn minus 1 plus 3 16th 
yn minus 2 plus 1 fourth xn minus 1. So this is the second order difference equation joining the output yn to the input xn in this particular system. So these two examples show, tell, show you how we can find out the difference equation pertaining to a model of a discrete time system which consists essentially of adders, delay elements and coefficient multipliers. The delay elements are somewhat corresponding to the integrators in your uh, L law computer simulation uh, and uh, of course the others are summing amplifiers and coefficient multipliers are quite similar to the adders and the uh, coefficient multipliers. Now, the converse problem is what is more of greater importance to us. Given the difference equation, how do you find out the model? That is the reverse problem. I will illustrate this by means of an example just now. We will take that uh, second order case again for the purpose of illustration and see how we can arrive at the model corresponding to a given difference equation. Suppose we have a second order difference equation yn plus a1 yn minus 1 plus a2 yn minus 2 equals b0 xn plus b1 xn minus 1 plus b2 xn minus 2. Now we can put this in the operator form 1 plus a1 e power minus 1 just as e advances e of yn becomes yn plus 1 e raised to the power of minus 1 yn can be set to indicate yn minus 1. So 1 plus a1 e minus 1 plus a2 e power minus 2 times operating on yn would be b0 plus b1 e power minus 1 plus b2 e power minus 2 times xn. So this operator polynomial can be written as f e yn equals g operating on xn. So this is the second order difference equation in, in terms of the various coefficients, in terms of the operator functions we put it in this fashion. So we would now like to arrive at a discrete time system model in terms of the various coefficients a1, a2, b0, b1 and b2 and arrive at this model. So for this purpose let us look at this particular circuit discrete time system model where we have an assembly of delay elements, adder units and coefficient multipliers. You have a summer here which accepts three inputs and you have an intermediate variable here. Suppose I call this intermediate the signal here as WN and this is multiplied by B0. This, so if this is WN, this will become WN minus 1. This is a delay element, WN minus 1. This is further delayed by another one unit. Therefore, this signal here WN minus 2. So you have YN as B0 WN plus B1 times WN minus 1 plus B2 times WN minus 2. All these the outputs of these coefficient multipliers are fed to YN. Therefore, obviously Yn will be B0 Wn plus B1 times Wn minus 1 plus B2 times Wn minus 2. That is one equation pertaining to this adder. Now, let us look at this situation here. The output of this adder will be xn minus a1 wn minus 1 minus a2 wn minus 2 because the output of this is minus a1 times wn minus 1. And the output of this coefficient multiplier is minus a2 times wn minus 2. So the sum of these three signals is wn. Therefore, I can write this as wn equals xn minus a1 times wn minus 1 minus a2 times w of n minus 2. Or I can put this in an alternative fashion xn as wn plus a1 times w of n minus 1 plus a2 times w of n minus 2. Okay, now let us see how this particular setup corresponds to the difference equation with which we started. Now you recall here that in this difference equation 
Fp operator polynomial is 1 plus a1 e power minus 1 plus a2 e power minus 2. So I can, in the same operator polynomials, I can write this as 1 plus a1 e power minus 1 plus a2 e power minus 2 operating on Wn. And 1 plus a1 e power minus 1 plus a2 e power minus 2, we call that Fe. Therefore, this will be Fe operating on Wn. Now, let us see. Here, this can be written as, Yn can be written as B0 plus B1 e power minus 1 plus B2 e power minus 2 operating on Wn. And you see that in the, in the original difference equation, B0 plus B1 e power minus 1 plus B2 e power minus 2, we call that GE. Therefore, this is GE operating on WL. So we have this intermediate variable WN is related to YN and XN by these two operator polynomials. So from these two equations, we can see from this, if I make Fe operating on Yn equals Fe operating on G operating on Wn. That is what we get from the first equation. Suppose I make G operate on Xn. G operating on Xn equals G operating on Fp, operating on Wn. So if you look at these two last equations, two, two equations, Fe, Ge operating on Wn, here we have Ge, Fe operating on Wn. So these operator polynomials work same as algebraic expressions. So Fe, Ge is the same as Ge, Fe. That means this term here and this term here are the same, which means Fe, Yn equals Ge, Xn. Therefore, in this particular discrete time system, we have the output and the input, Yn and Xn, are related in this fashion, Fe, Yn equals Ge, Xn. That is exactly the difference equation that we are trying to model. Therefore, this particular model represents this difference equation. So once we have this difference equation, we should be able to find out the discrete time model in this fashion in terms of the coefficients of the secondary difference equation. We have A1, A2, B0, B1, and B2. We as we know that A0, the coefficient of this can always be made equal to 1, and that's what we have done. So in this, the model can easily be established in this fashion. Now, we have illustrated this for the case of a secondary difference equation, and it's quite easy to see that this can be extended to a higher order difference equation also. By extending this in further down, by adding more delay elements, and adding an array of coefficients, B coefficients, and A coefficients, this can easily be extended to higher order difference equations also. Now, this type of model evaluation is useful in two ways. One is for hardware implementation of a particular difference equation. Once you have a difference equation and you would like to rig up a circuit in the laboratory which simulates the difference equation, this is how it can be done in terms of delay elements, in terms of the coefficient multipliers, in terms of the summers. Now, irrespective of the nature of the physical variable involved, the signals here are usually voltages. So the voltage represents a particular variable which uh, corresponds to the difference equation. That is hardware implementation, this is useful. The second way, second way in which this could be useful is because this gives you a convenience in your programming, in you are arriving at the suitable program for software implementation of the difference equation. So here you see, <coughs> this is the input and this is the output. The input and the output are related by an intermediate variable Wm. So you can, from given input, you can generate Wn by storing the samples n minus 1, n minus 2. So from given Xn sequence of samples, you can generate Wn using this equation. And using, that means you have to store the samples of one instance previously and two instances previously relating to this intermediate variable. So you calculate step by step. Once we have this, the output Yn is obtained by the intermediate variable Wn and the previous samples. So this makes for a convenience in storing the numbers, and this is useful for software implementations, because if you had to do this, use this 
equation, you not only have to store the values of x n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 1, output y n minus 1 and output at n minus 2 also. So this is convenient in some ways of programming for a software implementation. So this discrete time models that we have discussed here are useful in two ways for hardware implementation and also to give you a guidance, a direction in which programs can be obtained for software implementation. So let us now, after this discussion of the models of discrete time system, proceed to a discussion of the Z transform method, which is the most convenient one of solving the difference equations pertaining to the discrete time systems. To introduce the Z transform, let us first of all introduce a plausibility argument drawing on our knowledge of continuous time systems. In the case of a continuous system, we said that if you have a characteristic signal e to the power of st, then the output, the forced response is hs times e to the power of st is a continuous time system where hs is the Laplace transform of the impulse response ht. So if for a characteristic signal here, e to the power of st, you will get the output, the characteristic signal multiplied by hfs, where hf is the Laplace transform of the impulse response. For the discrete time system, suppose the input xn is z power n, that is the characteristic signal, and hn is your impulse response. Then we saw yn equals hn convolved with xn. That is what we are having. Therefore, I can write this as hk, the signal now is z to the power of n, so z n minus k, summed and and that I can write further as z power n taken outside summed on k hk z power minus k. So we observe that if the input is a characteristic signal, characteristic signal, the output is the same characteristic signal multiplied by a quantity like this. So if in the continuous system the characteristic signal is multiplied by hfs e to the power of st, zn is multiplied by the impulse response hk samples transformed in some fashion and producing you a function hz. So we can think of this as a transform of the impulse response hk, hk multiplied by z minus k the summation of all such samples is h of z and since just like h of s is the Laplace transform of h of t, we can consider h of z as a new transform of the impulse response samples hk and this provides you a kind of analogy and a motivation for making the z transform. So formally, we can make the z transform of a function fn, we will write this as fz as summation of the samples fn z minus k. We can use the same z. Usually we write the lower case z for this. fz is fn z minus k. Now this, the summation we extend from 0 to infinity. When you extend 0 to infinity, this is called single sided z transform. We are usually interested in discrete time functions fn, whose values are important to us for positive values of n, non 
non-negative values of n. Therefore, single sided Z transform is most important for us. And this is this transformation f of Z is called the Z transform of this. We'll say for all Z for which the series converges. So just as you have the Laplace transform converging for certain values of S, here also we have a region of convergence. And the, region, the, the complex plane for Z in which the series converges, this is called the region of convergence. We will see that later, what that region will be for different functions, abbreviated usually as ROC, region of convergence. We have a shorthand notation, say Fn and Fz form a Z transform pair and discrete time function in this fashion. You can put an arrow like this. You can get recover one from the other. You can also write Z transform of Fn equals F of Z and inverse Z transform of F of Z equals f of n. These are all compact ways of expressing the discrete time and the transform pair. Now depending upon the value of fn, there is a certain region of convergence. And for single sided z transform like this, usually this region of convergence turns out to be a region outside a circle of certain radius. So this is the radius you are having certain say R. So this is the region of convergence for single sided Z transform. So the magnitude of Z must be greater than some value R. For single sided Z transform, the region of convergence turns out to be the region outside a circle of certain radius and this R is a function of F of n. R depends on F of n. Depends on the particular function that you are talking about. In addition, we have a two-sided Z transform, which we are not going to talk about much, but I'll just mention this in passing, where you take, recognize the sequence of values for Fn for both positive and negative n. Then F of Z will turn out to be, in this case, n from minus infinity to plus infinity of Fn z minus n. Same z of course you use. It turns out that here the region of convergence would be the angular region between two circles. So if this is m, the, the inner radius is m, the outer radius is n, then the region of convergence for that is the z must be larger than m magnitude and less than n. So that is the reason of convergence for a two-sided z transform. But in our uh, work, we will not use the two-sided z transform uh, because that is not necessary for our purpose. Uh, it is only to given here to give you some additional information. But two-sided z transform, you must recognize that the reason of convergence is the angular region. And uh, one-sided Z transform is a special case where N extends to infinity, right. Now let us look at the Z transforms of some basic functions, basic Z transforms. One. We will write here Fn, the, the, let us take delta n, Im, unit impulse. The corresponding f of z, of course, is you can write n equals 0 also, Fn z. This is the general definition, and our particular input 
delta n has value only at n equal 0 and nowhere else and therefore in this whole summation you have only one term which is non zero therefore at n equal 0 this is 1 and z to the power of minus 0 is also equal to 1 therefore the value of this is equal to 1. So it is a very neat result that the unit impulse delta n has a z transform equal to 1. It is very similar to what we have in the continuous time system where we have delta t a signal it has a Laplace transform equal to 1 almost a similar result we are having here also. And the reason of convergence after all whatever z you have this is result is true therefore no restriction entire plane. So z value can take any any value it does not really matter. Second suppose you take the unit step function u f then the z transform would be n from 0 to infinity u n z minus n and n equal 0 this is 1 and this is also 1 n equals 2 this is 1 this is z power minus 1 n equals 2 this is still 1 this is z power minus 2 and so on and so forth. So this is an infinite series 1 plus z minus 1 z minus 2 extending on up to z minus infinity. So this can be written as 1 over 1 minus z power minus 1 provided z minus 1 is less than 1. The magnitude of that is less than 1 or z magnitude is greater than 1. So as long as z magnitude is greater than 1, z power minus 1 has a magnitude less than 1 and this is the z transform of that. This can be more compactly put as more conveniently put as z over z minus 1. Now the reason of convergence for this as you can see that z must be greater than 1. That is the reason of convergence. So in the unit circle outside the unit circle is a reason of convergence for this unit step function. Okay. Now let us take a third case. Suppose I take a complex number wn un. Then the z transform for that would be wn and n equal 0 to infinity in that range un is going to be equal to 1 therefore I drop that out and z power minus n. So this is equal to n equal 0 to infinity of z upon w raised to the power of minus n. And this has the same form as this series except instead of z I have z over w therefore this is 1 over 1 minus z over w to the power of minus 1 or 1 over 1 minus w upon z or z upon z minus w. So this is the uh, z transform of this and the reason of convergence for this once again is z upon w must be greater than 1 or z must be greater than w. So here instead of here the unit circle here the reason of convergence is a circle of radius w outside the circle of radius w. <coughs> so that is how one can calculate the z transforms of uh, basic uh, discrete time signals. We will extend this to few other waveforms in a moment. The last waveform discrete time signal for which we found out the z transform was this wn un has z transform z over z minus w the reason of convergence z magnitude is greater than w. We will extend this now let us say we have e to the power of minus n alpha un that is an exponential signal decaying with a certain constant time constant e to the power of minus n alpha un. Now we can use the earlier result to get at this after all e to the power of minus alpha is can be identified with w therefore I can write this as z over z minus e to the power of minus alpha. So e to the power of minus alpha can be used in place of z and that is what you are having. So the reason of convergence is 
if the Brahman's. If alpha is real, of course, this is real quantity. If alpha is complex, you have to put this. There is no reason for e to the power of minus alpha not being complex because w we said is a general complex number. So we can now extend this to find out the z transform of cos n omega to n. Now cos n omega can be written as e to the power of j n omega plus e to the power of minus j n omega divided by 2. So we can find out the z transform of e to the power of j n omega u n and e to the power of minus j n omega u n, add them up, divide by 2 because z transform satisfies the property of linearity which is quite easy to show. Now compared with the earlier result, instead of e to the power of minus alpha, you have e to the power of j omega. That is the only difference. Otherwise, this fits in with this or fits in with this. Therefore, for the first term, you, we will put half here to start with because of this. For the first term, e to the power of j, j n omega u n, the z transform of that will be z upon z minus. Instead of e to the power of minus alpha, I have e to the power of j omega. That is the only difference, e to the power of j omega. For the second term, you have e to the power of minus j omega instead of e to the power of minus alpha. So z of minus e to the power of minus j omega. So that is the only difference that you are having here. So you can have a common denominator, z squared, and minus z times e to the power of j omega plus e to the power of minus j omega. Together, they will can be written as minus 2z cos omega and the product of these two is equal to 1 and 4. This is, the, this is the denominator, z squared minus 2z cos omega plus 1. As for the numerator is concerned, we have a z squared term here and a z squared term here and z times e to the power of minus j omega, z times e to the power of j omega. So together they will give 2z times cos omega with a negative sign and because of this half that 2 can be cancelled out and you get z times z minus cos omega. So that is the z transform of cos n omega u n and this is a very important relation. Now this, the reason of convergence for that, z must be now magnitude must be greater than the magnitude of e to the power of j omega. The magnitude of e to the power of j omega is of course known to be 1, therefore the reason of convergence is the reason outside the unit circle. Likewise, you can establish the z transform of sin n omega u n proceeding exactly in a similar fashion except now you have two, 1 over 2j and a minus sign in front, otherwise the treatment is the same. I will give the final result this turns out is z sin omega divided by the same denominator z squared minus 2z cos omega plus 1. So that is the z transform of sin n omega u n. We will have one more. Let us find out the z transform of R n. which of course is n times u n. We can write the z transform for that f of z equals n 0 to infinity of n times that minus. Which can be written because n equals 0, I can write n equals 1 to infinity of n z minus n. To find out the summation of this, we can, will follow a little, a little, a little trick, a little manipulation here. Suppose I multiply this z by f of z, z f of z, then all I have is n from 1 to infinity of n times z minus n plus 1. That is what you are having. Now this is a summation with index n from 1 to infinity. Suppose I change the, because after all this is a dummy index, once I have 
this summation done, n disappears, and you have purely a function of z. That's what you get. So I would like to replace n by n plus 1. Suppose I do that. Put let n be replaced by n plus 1. Then I have n plus 1. Then I have n is replaced by n plus 1 minus n minus 1 plus 1. Therefore, I have z power minus n. And since the old n is replaced by new n plus 1, right? So n is equal to 1 becomes this n equal 0 here because the new variable here has a value 0, 0 to infinity. So yes, z f of z is 0 to infinity of n plus 1 z power minus n. Now suppose I subtract this from this. I have z minus 1 f of z equals. I subtract this series from this. So when n equals 0, this is 1 times z power minus 1, 1 will be there. And from then onwards, I have n from 1 to infinity, n plus 1 minus n, that is 1 times z power minus n. And that can be shown to be 1 plus z minus 1 by 1 minus z minus 1. And you can simplify this and show that is z upon z minus 1, and therefore f of z equals z upon z minus 1 whole square. z upon z minus 1 whole squared. And the reason of convergence for this can be shown to be the same as for the unit step function and the other uh, sinusoidal functions and so on. So these are the basic z transforms. The <laughs> importance of the reason of convergence comes because when you want to find out the discrete time function corresponding to a particular f of z, it is important for us to know what the reason of convergence is because it will enable us to expand the f of z properly in the form of a polynomial. Example, suppose I ask you to find out the discrete time function corresponding to 1 over 1 minus z. So if you have 1 over 1 minus z, I can think of, suppose I expand this, 1 plus z plus z squared like that and going up to infinity. This expansion is valid only for the magnitude of z less than 1. Therefore, obviously, this does not pertain to a, the z transform of a single-sided z transform. So this particular expansion is not valid for a single-sided z transform. It turns out that this is suitable for valid only for two-sided z transform. Suitable for two-sided z transform. In fact, for a two-sided z transform, just like uh, z minus 1 indicates a delay, z plus 1 indicates a shift in the forward direction, and we can uh, interpret this suitably. But suppose we are stick to a two-sided, one-sided z transform, then the expansion in this form is not valid. Therefore, we must write this as, suppose I multiply this by z minus 1. So z minus 1 divided by z minus 1 minus 1. This is what we are having. Suppose I multiply both numerator and denominator by z minus 1, this is what you will have. Then this I can write as minus z minus 1 by 1 minus z minus 1. And now we expand this, minus z minus 1, 1 plus z minus 1 plus z minus 2, and so on and so forth. And this can be written as z minus 1 plus z minus 2 plus z minus 3, etc., etc., all with a negative sign and out in front. And since we know f of z is f of n times z minus n, that means minus 1 is the sample at n equals 1, minus 1 is the sample at n equals 2, minus 1 is the sample at n equals 3. Therefore, the time function corresponding to that will be like that. 1, 2, 3, 4, all minus 1. And at n equals 0, 
there is no constant term that is equal to 0. Therefore, the f of n corresponding to that is minus of u of n minus 1 because this unit step delayed by 1 unit and also has a negative value. So, f of n corresponding to this minus of u n minus 1. So, the region of convergence now <coughs> dictates to us the type of expansion that you should have because for a given f of z can be expanded in different ways. The region of convergence tells you which is the proper expansion that is necessary because only when z, z is greater than 1 or z minus 1 magnitude is less than 1 is this expansion possible. Right. <coughs> now we have discussed in this lecture so far the first of all the we talked about the uh, modeling of discrete time systems using various elements like delay elements, adders and uh, coefficient multipliers. Then we introduced ourselves to the concept of Z-transform and found out the Z-transforms of various basic discrete time functions. The next topic that we should take up is the property, various properties of Z-transforms just as we have taken the various properties of Laplace transforms in our earlier discussion and uh, one important property which we would like to discuss just now and leave it at that, the others will take up in the next lecture, linearity because this is a very simple and a trivial property which we can always prove. If f1 n has the Laplace tra as the z transform f1 z and f2 n has the z transform f2 z then c1 f1 n plus c2 f2 n as the z transform c1 of f1 z plus c2 times f2 of z for all real constants for all constants c1 and c2 and in fact we have made use of this property in deriving the z transform of cos n omega and sin n omega where we broke up cos n omega and sin omega in terms of exponential functions and c1 and c2 happens to be 1 over 2 or 1 over 2j as the case may be. This is a, a particular <coughs> illustration of this. The second property which I will just briefly mention, we will discuss this in greater detail later. Suppose delta n as the z transform 1 as we have already seen. What is the z transform of a unit sample standing at n equals 1 that is delta n minus 1? It is clear that the z transform of this is equal to 1. The z transform of this in the expansion f n z minus n you have a sample n equals 1 only no other way no other place. So from n equals 0 to infinity all the other samples are 0 this will be equal to f1 times z minus 1. f1 happens to be delta, this is delta 1. Delta, this is 1. f1 happens to be 1. Therefore, this is simply z minus 1. That means if you delay this impulse by one sampling instant, one unit, the z transform is getting multiplied by z minus 1. So, a general rule therefore is that if you delay a particular fn, un suppose you are having and this is f of z. If you delay all the samples, the sequence by k units, f n minus k, u n minus k, then this will be z power minus k f of z. That means every sample here in the original se uh, sequence is now occurring k units later. So, if you are having here f n, now assuming f n is a causal signal, the same sequence of values occur k instants later. So, a particular sample if it was multiplied by z minus n in the earlier case, it is now became getting multiplied by z power minus of n minus k. So, every if every term here is now multiplied by an additional term z minus k. Therefore, if f n is like this, f n minus k will have this z transform. So, this is an important property, delay of a causal signal. So, if a 
That means when you delay this, all these values become zero because earlier signal was causal signal. Therefore, when you delay this, these up to k, they're all delay. They're all zero. And once you have a causal signal delayed by k units, the z transform gets multiplied by z power minus k. Now, what happens if this, this is not a causal signal? Suppose there are some sample values here. When you delay this, you have some other additional values here. What happens? This will not be, result will not be true. You will have some additional terms, and that we will take up in the next lecture. So, uh, after uh, discussing the, after introducing ourselves to the concept of Z transform and finding out the basic, the Z transforms are basic functions, discrete functions of time, we have talked about the linearity property and the property of the Z transform when the discrete time function is delayed by k units. The consequence in the transform domain is multiplication by z power minus k. Some additional ramifications of this result is what we'll take up first thing in the next lecture. And from that point onwards, we'll proceed further with the discussion of properties of z transforms.